So I'm here today to tell you about a huge myth. This myth is so pervasive that almost everyone believes it, including many healthcare professionals. And this myth could be considered a leading cause of persistent low back pain. Here's the myth. Are you ready? Pain equals damage. Now, on very many levels, this feels right to us, doesn't it? You get an injury, nerves carry pain signals to your brain, and you feel pain. But actually, research has shown us that the experience of pain is so much more complex and nuanced than this, and actually, that it's not just about damage at all. For example, we know that you can have an injury with no pain. If you took 100 people who'd never had low back pain and put them in an MRI scanner, 50% of them would have a disc bulge or osteoarthritis that was producing no symptoms and absolutely no pain. We also know that you can have pain without an injury. Think of migraines as an example. The head pain that accompanies a migraine can be really severe, but there's no initial injury, there's no lasting damage, and within a few hours, the person's usually completely recovered. So what was all that pain about? We even know that you can have pain without a body part. Some of you might be familiar with phantom limb pain. This is where a person experiences pain from a limb that's no longer there, and commonly this would happen in amputation. But there are many cases of people born without limbs experiencing sensations from limbs that they never had. And this can be replicated in non-amputees as well. Some fascinating research being done out in Australia has shown that in certain research situations, a person can be made to feel pain in someone else's body. And a person can be made to feel that kind of deep, tingly, aching sensation that's often associated with acupuncture when acupuncture is performed on a prosthetic limb, even if the person has never had acupuncture before. So if we know that you can have an injury with no pain, pain with no injury, and pain without even a body part, then our experience of pain cannot just be about tissue damage. We actually now know that many things go into the creation of an experience of pain, and it's all to do with complex interactions within the nervous system. But because that's quite complicated, I like to think of it like a fire alarm. Because fire alarms don't actually sense fire, do they? Typically, their sensors are sensitive to heat or smoke. And in the same way, there are no pain signals, pain nerves, or pain pathways in your body. Receptors on the end of your nerves are sensitive to things like pressure and touch, certain chemicals in the area, temperature and stretch. And all of these things might imply that there was some tissue damage, but not always. But we actually know that the brain takes a lot of other things into account as well. It will assess your mood and the level of stress hormones in your blood. It will take clues from your environment, sight, sound, and smells, to work out where you are and what you're doing. It will call on your memory bank to ask if you've been in this situation or this environment before. And importantly, it will take into account your own personal beliefs about your health and your body. And with all of this information at its disposal, the brain asks one question. Do I need to protect myself. And if the brain decides that there is credible evidence of threat, it will produce the experience of pain to protect you. Like that fire alarm sensing heat or smoke, it will sound the alarm. And this essentially means that pain is not something that exists in our body. It's created by our brain and projected onto our body. Now, I'd like to take a minute, if I may, to answer a question that I know a lot of you might be thinking at this point. You may be thinking, well, are you saying then that for some people, their pain is all in their head? No, I'm saying for all of us, 100% of the time, our pain is in our head. But don't misunderstand me. Let me explain what I mean by that. What I mean is that 100% of the time, Pain is an output of your brain and not an input from your body. What I'm not saying is that if your pain isn't associated with tissue damage, that it's somehow less real. If we go back to that fire alarm analogy, you can have a fire alarm that goes off in a genuine house fire or when you burn your toast. Regardless of what is driving that fire alarm, the sound it makes is still the same. 
And it's the same with pain. Regardless of what's driving your experience of pain, whenever that experience of pain is triggered in your brain, it is equally real and equally valid. And for this reason, we need to move away from the pain equals damage myth. Because if we believe that pain is an accurate indicator of tissue damage alone, not only is this not true, it actually can be very unhelpful. I mentioned in the beginning that this myth could be considered a leading cause of persistent low back pain. And one of the reasons for that is that the language that we use when we talk about low back pain can be really frightening. We talk about slipped discs or ruptured discs, degenerative joints, weak cores, twisted pelvises, or a spine that's out. And all of these things can sound really frightening, even though they're not life-threatening things at all. But what happens when we use this kind of language is that people become frightened of their own bodies. Now, we just heard, didn't we, that fear and beliefs about your body and stress hormones play a really important role in the generation of an experience of pain. And so we can see how a vicious cycle might begin here, where a person feels pain and becomes frightened, and so feels more pain and becomes more frightened. And so an obvious ask from me today is that if you're here as a healthcare professional, especially if you're in the manual therapies, physio, osteo, chiro, please stop scaring your patients. We don't have good evidence that weak cores and twisted pelvises really exist in the way that we tend to describe them. But we do have good evidence that the language we use when we talk to our patients about their pain can make them feel weak and fragile and vulnerable. And that absolutely does contribute to their experience of pain. But if you're here today as somebody who's been struggling with long-standing pain, and statistics would suggest that that's one in five of you, then let me give you three truths to combat the pain equals damage myth and help you with your pain. Number one, you are fundamentally strong. Now, you might be familiar with those statistics that sometimes pop up in health and safety at work that say if you're sitting with bad posture or bending and lifting with bad posture, double the amount of pressure is put on your spine. Well, the research that originally generated those statistics was done on cadavers. That is, people who've donated their bodies to science for experimentation after their death. And so for me, this study confirms something very obvious that dead bodies should not sit in chairs or lift heavy boxes. <laughs> Your living tissues are remarkably strong and resilient, and it actually takes a lot more effort than you'd think to do serious damage. But moreover, from that particular study, even the highest levels of pressure that were measured in those cadavers would have been well within tolerance levels for a living, adaptable spine. You are not a fragile structure. Number two. Don't fear movement. It's a really common misconception that bending is bad for your back. And we're told all the time, aren't we, to straighten up and to brace your core before you do any kind of bending or lifting in day-to-day -day life. But honestly, stiffening your spine like that all the time is really unnatural. And we have lots of very good, very strong evidence for the many benefits of movement, staying active and keeping mobile for all types of pain. But specifically for low back pain, we do know that staying active, and for many people that would include staying in work, leads to better outcomes overall, including a faster recovery time and less pain. So don't fear movement. Motion is lotion, as they say. Number three, you are getting better. Think back to the last time that you had a cat scratch or a paper cut. How long did that take to get better? Would you have been surprised if a year later it was still bleeding? Of course you would. We're so used to our skin healing and repairing itself, aren't we? But we often don't extend that same faith to the bits that we can't see, like our joints or our discs. But the same immune cells that are healing your skin are working on your insides too, and they're constantly at it, healing and repairing and protecting. So you can have some faith. You are always getting better. Now, I feel that this topic is so incredibly important because a misunderstanding of pain and a fear of our own bodies is actually a huge burden for the individual. Patients tell me all the time that they've had to stop doing things they love or they can no longer do things that are really important to them because they just don't trust that their bodies will cope with it. 
In fact, I had one patient tell me that she felt she had no choice but to have an abortion because of the unbearable strain a pregnancy would have put on her lower back. But the impact is not just felt at the individual level. In the UK, neck pain and low back pain are both leading causes of absenteeism from work. And the UK, like most European countries, spends between 2 to 3% of GDP every year in their treatment. And this actually makes the treatment of this type of pain more expensive than diabetes and cancer combined. Imagine how different it would be if we threw out the pain equals damage myth. If instead of potentially spiraling into inactivity and fear, we remembered that we're fundamentally strong and capable of getting better. How liberating would it be if we remembered that movement will build our bodies and not break them? And how empowering would it be if we recognized the full potential of our brain to control our pain? Thank you.